Boy, there's a lot going on in the world at the moment, isn't there? As we sit here today, inflation's the highest it's been for years. Interest rates are rising, and people are wondering, how high will they go? Plenty of tech stocks are down, some up to 50%. The war in Ukraine continues, supply chains are broken, and the pandemic is lingering. China's in lockdown, we've got a new government, and it goes on and on. Somehow it feels like there's more economic uncertainty than there's been for years even though that's probably not the case. But what does this mean for Australia's economy and our property markets? Now, since they don't operate in isolation, each month I take time out to look at the big picture, the macroeconomic factors affecting not just Australia but the world economy in these Big Picture podcasts with Pete Wargent in our attempt to give you a little more clarity on what's ahead. So welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Boys, there have been a lot happening since I last spoke with Pete Wargen for our monthly Big Picture podcast, and I briefly outlined some of those factors in the introduction. Now, while regular listeners would know Pete well, if you're new to this podcast, well, firstly, welcome, because I see there's thousands of new listeners every month. But the reason I'm keen to discuss these matters with Pete Wargen is not because of his academic credentials as a chartered accountant, a chartered secretary, or or because he's got a financial planning diploma. But I enjoy these chats because of the credible perspective Pete brings on what's happening around the world with his experience as an international investor and business person. So so welcome, Pete. Thanks, Michael. There's a bit going on, so looking forward to it. Well, I initially spoke in the introduction about some of the challenges we're experiencing, but but we shouldn't forget overall how well our economy is doing. It really is in many ways the envy of a lot of other places in the world. We've got reasonably strong economic growth, unemployment is at historic lows, interest rates, even though they're going up, are still very, very low. Our stock market, yeah, it's down, but nothing like what the US stock market's done. Retail trades up, planned business investments high, skilled vacancies have risen, Uh, there's more job ads than ever. We're not doing too badly, Pete. No, I mean, if you consider that if we were having this conversation, let's say two years ago, in 2020, we couldn't have dreamed that the economy would be doing as well as it is now. As you said, unemployment is at the lowest level in about 50 years. A couple of years ago, we were looking at potentially 10% unemployment and a huge amount of uncertainty about what would happen uh, before the vaccines were rolled out and Australia put in place one of the biggest stimulus packages of all of the developed countries. And we've really reaped the dividends in terms of the speed of the rebound. And in fact, it's that incredible rebound in the economy that's creating some of the uncertainty now because we've got a lot of metrics at um, record highs. So um, starting to think about interest rates being normalized, uh, which leads to all the doom and gloom forecasts in the media. But compared to where things were a couple of years ago, it's like chalk and cheese. Just couldn't have believed we'd have been in this stronger position. Well, we'll unpack some of those as we go along, but we also should recognise that despite all the good things, there are still some major overseas issues that are holding back the world's economic recovery and affecting us too. I mean, the the, the war in Ukraine, who would have thought it would have gone on that long? That was, I guess, my ignorance thinking it would be over quickly, but that's pushing up oil prices and energy prices. And China, it's having its own challenges with COVID and its lockdowns, Pete. Yeah, it feels like at the moment, um, because of those geopolitical issues, that there's more uncertainty than there's been in a long time. But in some senses, that is an illusion. Quite often when you get uh, what's apparently stability, well, um, take 2019 as an example, things seem to be on a reasonably predictable track. And then something comes along out of left field, a pandemic, and it shatters that illusion of certainty. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot happening. China with the lockdowns has been one issue. But as you mentioned, with the Ukraine conflict, that's Russia and Ukraine combined 
account for about 30% of the world's uh, wheat belts. And then there's half of the world's sunflower oil and 35% of the world's barley. And I guess those markets have effectively been shut off from the rest of the world because of the sanctions on Russia. Uh, So it's creating food shortages, energy price pressures. So we're starting to feel it now in things like fuel and um, and energy prices and household bills. And so there's a lot of inflation around and a lot of uncertainty about how long all this will go on for. Well, I read Robert Gottliebson suggesting that Russia's going to get us back in a different way. It's not going to press the button and set off nuclear attacks. It's going to affect the Western world with food shortages. Uh, so the United Nations put out a report um, in May 2022 that suggested 323 million people around the world face potential starvation because of the uh, severe food shortages and rising prices. And that's a massive increase. Now, things increased partly because of COVID and the response to the pandemic, but now because of what's happening with Ukraine and Russia. So and there's a lot of pressures um, on the food supply and even a potential famine around the world. That's helping Australia's trade surplus, and we're not wanting to take advantage of other people's misfortunes. But exports have risen, service exports have risen, but there's also food. We could well be the food bowl, and boy, I would have thought we could also be uh, the energy support of a lot of countries, but it doesn't sound like we're making enough gas and fuel anyway. Yeah, so interesting with Australia being uh, such a commodity-rich country, and yeah, we're still facing pressures on our own prices. But you're right. I mean, uh, things like iron ore and coal have been in tremendous demand over recent years, but also LNG, natural gas, uh, massive investments in Australia over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. And now, as you mentioned, Australia's um, exports have hit record highs, around $50 in a month. It's it's huge numbers. Um, So... Australia is often described as a lucky country, partly because of where we're positioned in the world, but also tremendously resources rich. Um, So it's a relatively good position to be in, all things considered. And our trade surplus is doing well because we're exporting, but we're not importing as much. They've fallen over the last little while. I guess part of that's related to uh, supply chain shortages. Yes, that's right. So during the pandemic, like every country, there was a huge drop in demand and imports, things are starting to rebound now, but there's still a bit of a way to go before things get back to normal. Well, let's talk a bit more about Australia's economy, because in this big picture podcast, we're talking about the things that are affecting property and our businesses and our lives in general. Just recently, the GDP figures came out for the March quarter, and it depends who you're listening to. Some said, gee, we're doing very well, but it was really only a moderate 0.8% increase in the last quarter. Nothing like that huge uh, increase we had in the December quarter, but that came off a very low basis. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things to look out for. When you get a recession, in this case, actually almost like an enforced closure of the economy, some of the numbers can look extraordinary as they rebound. And sometimes it probably is a bit easier just to take a look at the trend over a few years rather than year-on-year figures because they can get very, very distorted. Look, the economy is still growing at above 3%. If you look at what they call nominal GDP, so GDP in current prices terms, I mean, that's really boomed back, record highs. It's uh, driven, well, unemployment is, as we mentioned, it's what, 3.9% is expected to fall to 3%. So we haven't seen anything like that since the 1970s. Interest rates are historically low, but probably going to rise from here uh, to some degree. And um, consumer spending, very strong. Job vacancies, record highs. And business investment also, strongest we've seen in a decade. So there's lots of good things happening. I guess the thing that's concerning households is, well, how far will interest rates rise and what impact will that have on their expenditure, particularly because consumer prices, as we mentioned, are on the way up? Well, the other thing affecting households is wages, of course, and we've got the lowest unemployment levels in half a century. The most recent uh, SEEK job ads statistics showed they've risen again. So Overall job ads on SEEK are 76% higher than the pre-pandemic levels. Now, Pete, while migration started to flow in, it's still at relatively low levels. So I can see it's going to take some time for migration to alleviate these widespread labour shortages. 
Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. I think if you look at the official projections, it won't be until the end of 2023 before immigration's back to what we considered a normal level. So that would be population growth of around about 1.5% or 350,000 or 400,000. But it's going to take some time. Now, we do need those new people because, as you mentioned, we've got really bad skill shortages in some parts of the economy. If you take a walk around uh, Noosa, every second shop, either closed due to skill shortages or urgently hiring. So you can see it all around the place. In some ways, it's a nice change because we had a lot of slack in the labour force in recent years. But we do really need to start um, opening the borders and letting some skilled migrants back in. Well, it'll be interesting to see if the new government increases uh, the migrant intake, especially for skilled labour. And I think it'll be good to see students coming back as well. And they seem to be coming back because our education system's a large part of our economy as well. Yeah, you can actually see that with your own eyes. Uh, Now, this is more anecdotal than statistically based, but you can see in Queensland in particular, a lot of the Indian international students have returned and other parts of Asia, but not so much the Chinese students, because as you touched on before, um, there's travel restrictions, relationships have generally cooled a little bit with China over recent years um, for well-documented reasons. So I guess that's one of the little holes in the international student numbers is that the uh, Chinese students who were actually the the main driver of the growth and the expenditure in Australia, um, the Chinese students haven't come back yet. Uh, So universities will be pushing to ramp up numbers. Certainly if you look at what's happened in Canada, United Kingdom, the massive push to get international students back in. And I expect Australia will follow over the next year or so. So we shouldn't take it for granted because those other countries are trying hard to get the same skilled labour that we're getting as well. Now, Pete, let's have a quick talk about inflation because that's in the news the whole time. Now, we know the Reserve Bank's got a target range of between 2 and 3% on average over a period of time. But for most of the past 10 years, that target's been missed on the downside. Now, of course, it's the other way around. Inflation's returned on the upside. And while too much inflation could be a problem. Remember, as you said uh, a minute ago, this uh, is, uh, I guess, the result of an unintended consequence of the success we're having. We've had massive spending because of the COVID lockdowns, and we've been at home and buying things at home, And but it's set the stage for a massive recovery. Is this target range of 2 or 3% still relevant today, Pete? Uh, yeah, so we, we actually were under the target range for about six years. And there's a lot of debate about whether actually the inflation target might be too high. There was a lot of people saying maybe we should reduce Mm. the inflation target to 1% to 3%. Now, the headline rate of inflation is now above 5%. And because of what's happening to power and energy prices and rents and other parts of inflation in the economy, may well get to 7% or 8% in the second half of 2022. Now, the underlying or core inflation readings will be a bit lower, but we're going to be well over target. So I guess the big debate between economists is, well, how much of this is being driven by strong demand in the economy and how much of it is due to supply chain pressures that were created by the COVID shutdowns and now the conflict in Ukraine and also China's lockdowns? Well, obviously, it was both. Um, but if you look at some of the most recent figures, Things like um, secondhand car prices, they're coming back down. Um, internationally, there's a lot of research into this. Things like that you wouldn't expect, like secondhand Rolexes, you know, the prices are coming back down again after a big spike. Even new luxury car sales have dropped, I just recently read. Yeah, and there's, a, there's just a whole range of things that suggest that the demand side of that equation is just falling away now. Services readings in Australia have just started to contract. Consumer confidence is well below average now. Um, So obviously, you give people stimulus checks, um, as we did all around the world, people tend to spend it. They can't travel overseas. And that's definitely what happened. Huge boom in retail sales. And so there was definitely a demand side. that There was a big part of the inflation equation. But that seems to be falling away now. And what we're really left with is those supply chain issues which normally resolve themselves over time. 
Um, so what does that mean for policy and interest rates? Well, it, it kind of suggests to me that really there's not much point in hiking interest rates too quickly because demand is already starting to fall away in many parts of the consumer economy. And increasing interest rates isn't really going to help and things like energy and fuel prices. Um, so I expect we'll see interest rates rising through the second half of 2022, but it will just be a gradual 25 basis points a month until inflation starts to behave itself again. Well, I guess the central concept of monetary policy is that neutral interest rate. In other words, uh, adjusted for inflation, uh, where it's ni- monetary policy is neither expansionary, which it has been for a long time, trying to stimulate the economy, or contractionary. That's going to be hard. I think for a long time it was suggested that uh, the neutral interest rate is somewhere around 2 to 3%. It'll be interesting to see where it lands because obviously that's really hard to, to hit that rate, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't so long ago we talked about the neutral uh, setting of about three and a half percent or so. I, I mean, it feels to me like even with one interest rate hike, uh, there's a lot of uh, the sort of fees has come out of the economy, and the neutral rate might be much lower than people think. It could be one percent. You know, we might not get much above one. Now, obviously, a lot can change very quickly, as we've seen over the past year. But um, it'd be interesting to see with a couple more hikes whether some of that sort of consumer spending starts to get sucked out of the economy. If you look at what financial markets are expecting, well, I think that the cash rate by the end of the year might be above 2%, but it feels to me like we might never get there. Yeah, well, the markets are expecting much higher rates than uh, I think you and I think is going to happen. It'll be interesting. Well, let's talk a bit about property because that's what most people uh, hear about and it's one of your expertises and mine. And clearly we've moved to the next stage of the property cycle. Our property markets have had a lot to contend with this year, the pandemic, floods, geopolitical problems, rising interest rates, the election. But uh, capital city markets, especially Melbourne and Sydney and Canberra, have started to, to lose steam. And it seems to be coming from the fact that there's more stock on the market. Buyers are a bit more cautious. And just looking at auction clearance rates, uh, they, they're uh, not as high anymore. Uh, lending, which we, we like looking at loan approvals because that's a good leading indicator. They're dropping a bit. And even vendors are now bringing back their expectations. They're selling before auction. They're not trusting the auction process. They don't want to take a risk or they're withdrawing their properties. Clearly, we've moved to the next stage of the cycle, Pete. Yeah, I mean, it feels like to me a bit of a rerun of 2017 when you had a lot of froth and highly energetic buyers. And then suddenly, uh, the sentiment has reversed. And particularly at the very top end of the market, the premium prices Vendors have dropped their expectations very quickly. We're just starting to see that reflected in median prices. I think of the sort of the median and lower prices quartiles of the market, prices are likely to hold up. I think one of the interesting things is with um, unemployment already at 50 year lows and falling towards 3%, we're not going to see many forced sellers this time around. And you can actually see if you look at stock levels, they're still way below their half decade average particularly tight in cities like Brisbane and Canberra and Adelaide. Even despite the slowdown, there's not really that much stock piling up. And at the moment, it's only really the premium end of the market where we've seen much price adjustment. Well, that always happens. The premium end tends to lead the booms and lead the downturns. But your comment about lack of four sellers is an important one because for the property markets to crash, like some people are suggesting, you actually have to have sellers who have to sell, and there's no one there to buy. Discretionary sellers are dropping out of the market. So some people still have to sell. People are still getting married, getting divorced, having babies, or maybe not in that order. But life goes on, so they've got to actually uh, move house. But there's no forced sellers. And when you hear the reports from the various bank financial officers and CEOs, they're all saying that their loan books are in good condition. People are paid their mortgages well in advance, they don't see a lot of mortgage stress happening. No. So this is one of the things that uh, creates a bit of debate. There's certain surveys that um, always report high mortgage stress. But if you look at the Reserve Bank, and they have done some research into this, and they showed that incidents of mortgage stress are at record lows, which kind of makes sense. We've had record low mortgage rates. Um, We've got record high prepayments of mortgages and the average mortgage is two years ahead. So I don't think you'll see 
with unemployment at around 3 or 4%, there's not going to be many people forced to sell. Some will choose to sell. Some read the headlines and think that prices might drop. Um, so some people will be uh, tempted to sell for that reason. But the biggest um, indicator of mortgage stress is whether people can get a job or not. And job vacancies are record high. So there's a job for everyone who wants one. And uh, these days, there's not really much of a an incentive for banks to foreclose on people, even if they do fall behind on mortgage payments. Last two years, we've seen things like mortgage holidays introduced. I think there'll be very few forced sellers over the next couple of years. It's more just a sentiment thing. Yeah, sure. So it's the combination of rising inflation, high interest rates and unemployment that could create a property market crash. But on its own, rising interest rates will put some strain on those who've recently purchased, who've overcommitted. But we know that overall, the Australian property market, residential property market is worth close to $10 trillion. And overall, there's about two and a bit trillion dollars worth of loans against it. So the loan to value ratio in general is very low and there's no real risk to that. But interestingly, the latest lending figures started to show that people are just being a bit cautious. They're not making the commitments for buying property moving forward. No, I mean, uh, lending figures, uh, they declined in April, but they're coming from extremely high levels. So uh, some retracement is to be expected. I think the, the thing... If you think about, well, what you wrote in your book all those years ago, you know, what causes a property crunch? It's usually either very high interest rates where people just can't afford the mortgage, uh, high unemployment, or an oversupply of dwellings. Well, we don't have any of those factors. Um, in fact, um, you know, rental vacancy rates are the lowest in, what, 16 years, and uh, rents are in Sydney for houses absolutely rocketing higher. So I don't think um, when you look at the factors that can cause a sharp correction in property well they're just not there you know we interest rates will rise but that you know we're talking about the cash rate going from zero to one or two not very high levels of interest rates uh, so yeah some slowdown in lending is to be expected but that that was coming from an artificially high level through the covid rebound one of the interesting trends was the renovation booms continuing. So lending for alterations and additions in April was almost three times higher than pre-pandemic levels. And people have decided probably it's easier to renovate their home than move. It's hard to get builders at the moment anyway. So that was an interesting trend. But you were starting to say a moment ago, yes, we're experiencing a rental crisis. Vacancy rates are very low. Rents are rising. And what I'm now hearing is that many of the proposed apartment complexes that were on the drawing board and could have helped alleviate the rental crisis, they're not going to proceed at present because of problems with rising building costs, supply chain issues, finance approvals. In fact, I read that some complexes that were pre-sold are not proceeding because they're just not financially viable for the developer because of the rising costs and deposits have been returned to investors. Yeah, we tend to get an early read on this living on the Queensland coast. If you go down to the Gold Coast, you see uh, some of these projects where big towers were expected to go up in the next uh, two or three years. They're just being uh, closed up now and um, shutting down for the next cycle. I think um, the problem facing developers is um, it goes back to the supply chain issues. Uh, the cost of timber has rocketed. cost of steel has uh, gone much higher and just materials and also labor you know the cost of building um, a new home is up more than 20 percent in a year but if you're trying to fulfill a whole apartment project over the next two or three years a lot of developers just can't make these projects stack up well not at current prices what does that mean pete it means that the next round of apartments is going to cost a lot more have to yeah and that's where the price of new housing it, it tends to put a floor under things and underpin the established dwelling market and certainly land prices have increased a lot over the past two or three years you'll find that generally new apartments that are still being completed they're coming on at much higher prices and um yeah i mean I, uh, you would have a better read on this than me because metropole does uh developments but it, it's a bit like you know when you see fuel prices you know, the price of oil goes up and it, you know you see the petrol price go higher but it never seems to come back down it's a bit like that with uh, construction costs they they tend to be quite sticky they don't come back down very easily 
and in general, they've gone up about 20% over the last year for the medium density developments we're involved in. Uh, fortunately, the end value of the townhouses have gone up even more than that. So it's still viable, especially since our investors don't sell, they're keeping them in, in the long term. But construction costs have gone up. And you're right, they don't tend to come down. Now, Pete, I enjoy reading your daily blogs. And we'll leave a link to sh in the show notes of how to get those. But I'd like to just take up a couple of things that you've written in those blogs so you can uh, maybe go into a bit more detail. One of them recently suggested that you thought property investors should return to fundamentals. What did you mean by that? One of the things when you get very low interest rates is that you see a lot of speculation in the market, uh, not just in housing. Uh, we've seen it in cryptocurrencies, uh, tech stocks, things like you know, Netflix and Zoom and Coinbase, all of these companies, and even um, stuff like Beyond Meat and all, all of these sort of sort of uh, new growth companies, they don't really make any profits as such, but huge amount of speculation. Now, the 10-year bond yield in Australia, which is sort of the interest rate that you might term to be a risk-free return, well, that's at 3.5% now. So if you can get 3.5% return on your money, with absolutely no risk at all, then there's not really so much demand for people speculating wildly. And the, the same applies in the housing market. In a bull market, people will buy anything, any old rubbish, and they'll get good returns. But if you're you know, investing in property today, you probably you know, should go back to the fundamentals and take a 10-year view. Now, we've already mentioned unemployment at the lowest level in 50 years, uh, but there is, there's been some correction at the top of the market. But I guess um just goes back to you know, common sense, really, just using the strategies that you've always uh, promoted at, at uh, Metropole, which is tackling those landlocked suburbs, the missing middle of the market. I think we'll see very strong population growth over the next 10 years. It might be you know, three or four million. So there's going to be an enormous demand for housing. Uh, so I think people should just go back to fundamentals and take a 10-year view. Uh, look at those under-supplied capital city markets. And we're just starting to get skilled migrants and international students and tourists. They're all coming back to Australia. So a lot of demand over the next 10 years. In another one of your blogs, Pete, you explained that New Zealanders are coming back to Australia in droves. What's going on there? Yeah, I think if you um, – well, you'd remember, like years ago, we used to get a lot of Kiwis moving to Australia, wide more job opportunities, bigger economy – higher pay and then for a period of time that actually uh, went into reverse i think um partly related to the christchurch earthquake and i know you've been to new zealand i was quite surprised when i went to christchurch to see just the sheer scale of the rebuild and there was a period of time there where actually a lot of kiwis were going back to new zealand because there was a job shortage particularly in things like construction and we were actually losing people in the other direction well, I think now, surprisingly, uh, because wages and incomes are going back up in Australia, and also because Auckland is no longer a cheap place to be, uh, we're starting to see um, New Zealanders coming to Australia again. And that, that sort of impacts them more than us. But if you're getting twenty to 40,000 people per annum, um, Australia can absorb those people. But it's a big hit for New Zealand. Australia does have its own cost of living challenges, but actually lots of job opportunities and rising wages that's starting to bring people back in. And Pete, there's been a lot of talk about housing affordability. It came up a lot at the, big, at the end of the election campaign, falling home ownership rates. And again, I read in one of your recent commentaries that you felt home ownership rates could rise again, even back to the 70%. Why, why do you think that's the case? Yeah, it's an interesting one because housing affordability you know, if you were to sort of take the headlines at face value, you would think that nobody is buying and that and no first time buyers are coming into the market. Now, I guess the um, the reality has been that most people are getting onto the housing ladder later than they used to. Uh, we've also had, certainly over the past 20 years, we've had a, um, a huge um, intake of migrants. Uh, nearly 30% of Australians, including myself, were born overseas. So if, if you, if you, sort of uh, factor that into the demographic structure, of course, you can have more people renting because all new arrivals to Australia rent. We've seen, particularly in that sort of younger age bracket, home ownership rates have been falling. I guess the interesting thing is through the COVID period of a couple of years there, 
we saw the highest um, number of first home buyers uh, since the Rudd stimulus because of all of these, you know, the first home loan deposit scheme and all of the the grants and uh, discounts that were put in place for first home buyers. And actually now with the election campaign, well, both sides of politics went in with uh, incentives for first home buyers. So I guess um, with more and more first home buyers coming into the market since 2020, I don't know if we'll get back to 70%, but home ownership rates should be rising again, which is a good thing. Well, the government recognises the benefit of the wealth effect and also the fact that if people own their homes, when they eventually retire, they're going to be much better off and not as dependent upon the government. Well, Pete, I enjoyed uh, reading your, your regular insights because you, you come up with some different ways of thinking, just as I pointed out in those last couple of blogs. So if people want to uh, get more information about you. I know one area is through Pete's Property Podcast, and uh, I enjoy listening to that every week. So people can hear your podcast wherever they're listening to this one. But where else can they find out about you? Uh, easiest place to track me down, uh, Pete Wardian Blogspot. I have a daily blog post there where I sort of do a daily dump of all my ideas. So uh, easy place to track me down and also on Twitter, of course. I was going to say on Twitter, I don't know how much time you spend on <laughs> Twitter, but there's always some in interesting things. And you don't only just talk about property, but you're cl clearly a keen sports fan as well. So you give your opinions on that as well. Long-suffering England fan, but yes, uh, <laughs> usually far too active on the Twitter as well. And a little bit on Instagram, showing the lovely bits of uh, the Sunshine Coast where you live. So, Pete, thank you for once again sharing your wisdom in this monthly Big Picture podcast where we have a look at what's going on around in the world, the sort of things that I believe all property investors and business owners should understand because it's affecting what's happening. Look forward to catching up again real soon. Pleasure. Thanks, Michael. In a moment, I'm going to be sharing my mindset message with you, but just following on from my chat with Pete, clearly you can understand that the, the world is changing in front of our eyes and our property markets are going to be very, very different over the next coming years. But that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. There still are. I'm actively in the market and I know a lot of our high net worth clients are as well. So rather than sitting on the sidelines, why not explore what's possible for you? But of course, to be successful, you're probably going to need to change your strategy to cope with the new environment because the next couple of years will be very, very different for property. But my team at Metropol are prepared to, they're actually committed to helping you because they're going to use the frameworks and strategies that I've developed over five decades and that we've been helping clients with for over 20 years. In fact, our audited results show that Metropol's clients are 7.3 times more likely to own six or more properties than the average property investor. Wouldn't you like to be able to say that you're in that top 1% of property investors. So go to metropole.com.au and book your initial obligation-free chat with one of my team to discuss your individual needs. Remember, we don't have any properties for sale, but let our property strategist formulate a plan for you or review your existing portfolio. And then you can take advantage of the many services that Metropole offer, including wealth advisory, financial planning, renovations, development, property management, business advisory. We have a holistic approach with no properties for sale, but we do help a lot of clients buy property using our buyers agents, but only after we put a plan together. So let us help you plan to become the person you plan to become. Metropole.com.au Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. The mindset message I'd like to share with you today is that the moment is not permanent. Now what do I mean by that? Well, why do babies love playing peekaboo? Well, apart from the obvious fun, especially for adults, and I know that as a grandfather, it's because up till about the age of five months, babies haven't yet developed what they call object permanence. Object permanence is our knowledge that objects continue to exist even when they can't be seen, heard, touched, smelled or sensed. 
That's what psychologists tell us. Now, while this is a vital survival mechanism, it also means that as adults, we've got a tendency to think that it'll take us longer than expected to recover from an unpleasant event. These events have got power over us because we continue to relive them in our memories, trying to make sense of the trauma, trying to make sense of the confusion. It's this tendency to think that things are permanent that causes us to get stuck. Today blends into tomorrow and whether you felt that your day was good or bad, it's unimportant because your thoughts are limited by the possibilities that arise from that one thing, the thing that went wrong. But things can change in an instant. What's happening now won't go on forever. A chapter in your life is not the whole story. When you let go of the anxiety about your future and the depression about your past, you'll feel the only thing that's available to you is the present, the present moment, and what you make of it. So don't treat a bad day like it's been a bad year, because this day, this date, the date you're listening to this message, will never come again. Each breath you take is a precious gift that somebody else is fighting for. There are people on this planet who would love to be in your position, in your location, have the life that you've got. So rather than remember those bad memories, think about what you're grateful for, what you're grateful for right now because you'll never become wealthy unless you have an attitude of gratitude. Thank you for spending the last half an hour or so with me, and I hope you got some insights from my monthly Big Picture podcast with Pete Borchand, and hopefully you've got a little bit more clarity about what's going on around us and how it's going to affect our property markets. And if you did get some benefit, I'd really appreciate if you told somebody else about the Michael Yardy podcast, let them also learn and help me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially fluent. There's a share button on every podcast app, wherever you're listening to this, just tell somebody about it or tell the world by leaving a review. That'd be great as well. Now, my way of saying thank you for listening is I've got some reports and ebooks for you. Go to podcastbonus.com.au and I'd love to give you a gift for saying, my way of saying thank you for being part of this community. Now, you can also be part of my community by going to my private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update private Facebook group where every day I leave some tips, some information, a chart, something you won't get elsewhere. In the meantime, you can catch me on social media and I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?